Okay, so for our folks who were here last week, this should be a familiar document to you. It was a brief assignment where you were asked to add three of your own lines to this uh, worksheet that we did in class for each plank of the resolutional question. And so I know we only have two people who are returning from this week, but Nuriel sent me um, her worksheet and I'll add that in as we kind of go along. But I know that we had Maxim and Hong here from last week too. So if you two could just chime in with some of the some of your results, we can add them in here. So the three that I added for the yes forensic science to be reformed are some evidence can be too unclear to the jury, which you know may cause them to like misinterpret it and make a different decision. So what was the sentence that you had in the the article that you linked to it? Um, it was the Washington Post article. And I'm not sure if it directly said it in here, but like they mentioned something and I kind of like stemmed it from that. Okay, so what was the sentence that you wrote out? The sentence that I wrote was, some evidence can be too unclear to the jury, which may cause the jury to make a different decision. So we're, is this is under yes for reform or no for reform? Yes. How about you, Hong? Um, the one, one of them I had for forensic science was that forensic science firms are tied to law enforcement and prosecutorial offices. Let's get some for why some forensic science might not be reform. What are some of the, because I know that we all kind of found ourselves leaning on the side of yes, forensic science has enough areas that should be reform for us to consider. Um, but I know that we were, we were looking into some reasons why people were, were suggesting that forensic science might be good the way that it is. So what are some of the things that um, we found? So I didn't like really make points about like how it's good, but just how like if it is reformed, it would lead to like other problems. So one of the things that I said was how if large reforms are made, then the public image of like all forensic sciences could be hurt and even like effective and, you know, uh, true methods will be viewed as untrustworthy. To the public or to the courts? Um, more to the public, because I feel like they're more swayable. That's how it works. But yeah. Um, I had a similar type of like line of reasoning. Um, I thought that if forensic science was reformed, then like courts that have already like had this system in place for so many years might might not trust as much, and that they would start to like like kind of deny the evidence more or like they wouldn't it wouldn't be as trustworthy and they would probably have a have a lesser edge is that in a sentence for me um so i guess how do I use this um front, like changes to forensic science would weaken its influence in the courts why um, probably because right now, like, forensic science methods are tr 
trusted and they've been in place. So I guess because they're the status quo and changing it might like alter court's opinions of how trustworthy it is. Any other ones that we think are, are pretty important for us to consider? Okay, let's move on to policing. So were there, so outside of the list of the things that we went over with each other last week, did anybody find some good reasons why policing might need to be reformed that we didn't come up with? Um, I found that um, usually like when when police like are investigated for something, it's usually like the investigations are usually done by their own precincts or like the same department. And that can like lead to a lot of personal bias because the investigators may actually know the people they're investigating. And then um, I added kind of talking about qualified uh, immunity and how because police know that, that they have that, they are like more prone to um, be more reckless in the field because they know that they have that safety net. Did you say qualified immunity? Yeah. Anything else that you think that uh, should be shared with the course you two? Um. One more thing to mention that, I mean, kind of gets touched on a little bit, but just like the militarization of police and how, you know, when they have these kind of uh, tools and rhetoric that they're more prone to violence because the military is a violent thing. Um, I would also add that there's no national standard on like the excessive use of force. So like, a lot of police districts don't like, I mean, they, they can just like use chokeholds freely. about any reasons for why policing might not need to be reformed? The only semi answer I could think of was that if um, police feel threatened by reforms, then they might choose to like not do their jobs, which is something that we've heard at some points during, you know, these times. 
So like as ridiculous as it is. Sounds like an argument that we heard in debate about um, K debate, making it so that everybody will leave, you know, eventually folks will just stop playing the game because the game will be broken. Many police officers are intimidated by police reform standards in May. Are you, is your argument that they may ineffectively do their job because they're scared or they will leave the force? Um, kind of like saying if like you want to get rid of us or we or weaken us and like why should we protect you so kind of like using it as a threat for people to like not challenge their power um there's also the argument that if police standards are challenged enough it would lead to like the overall weakening of the police force, which could like increase crime, I guess. All right, so I'm glad we got some for that area. I know we were all struggling to figure out what are some considerations as to why policing, someone might argue that policing might not be reformed. The real purpose of this activity is to be able to not just see where you fall, more aligned in your own kind of perspectives about the topic. So what do you think about forensic science? What do you think about policing? What do you think about some things so you could have an, a, a clear understanding about some of your own opinions, as well as just to make some of the the general arg the general arguments that people on the opposing side will be making. So even if you don't believe that police are uh, not being reformed is a good thing, it's helpful that you were doing this research ahead of time to learn some of the reasons why people might be arguing that police reform is unnecessary. Um, and regardless of if we think that they're laughable or not, you know, it's good to have these things already um, in, in your lexicon kind of knowledge so that when someone is presenting it to you, it's not just something that you're like, this is ridiculous. You have a ton of different arguments as to why the, the logic of this, the argument doesn't make too much sense. Okay, so let's go into the last one and then we'll talk through um, ways, to, ways to kind of make use of this document. All right, so for sentencing, what do we got? Um, I said that the sentences for like drug uh, for like drug abuses were abnormally large. So like compared to other crimes, drug like um, drug carrying, it like sentences are based on the weight carried. So like someone could be could just like have a lot of a type of drug on them, and and be sentenced for like twenty years. Cough, cough, Nixon, cough, cough. <laughs> um, one of the things that I mentioned, oh, sorry. Let me finish. Uh, one of the things that I talked about was like the use of AI in the sentencing and how, because it's based off of like racist data that's, you know, been previously done by cops, it furthers that unfair and racist sentencing procedures.
I'm trying to figure out how to say what's wrong with saying correctly. Drug sentences are disproportionately given the longest. Sentencing. Okay. Any more that should be included? Just like another connection to the AI thing is that for those, you know, AI programs or whatever, that's from third party groups, so they could have ulterior motives. more for that area or do we want to move on to the other part okay so how about for why sentencing might not need to be reformed um i i said that um if sentencing was reformed like like if certain crimes were given like lesser sentences it might promote those crimes because like the public would no longer see a need to like kind of follow follow the law if there wasn't like considerable punishment for it. Yeah, Maxim. Um, one thing that, that I wrote down was that, like, if reforms are made, this is kind of similar to what Hong said, but like, if you know, there are overall smaller sentences, even for like people that you know commit dangerous crimes and pose a threat to society. Like, the example that I was thinking of was um, when the mafia members were taken out of jail for like COVID concerns or whatever, and then you know, they would cause problems in their neighborhoods or whatever. Yeah. So, kind of like with shrinking sentences and giving the possibility of dangerous people in society could lead to problems for may result in retaliation of person convicted for other individuals. I'm going to put that differently in people retaliating against others who I'm not sure exactly if that's what you were saying as well as just like um, those people just might continue to do the thing that they were doing before. That as well, but also what you said, I think, like, although that's like not directly what I was thinking, now that you wrote it down, I agree with that. that makes sense.
Okay. So how many of you have uh, done a practice debate thus far for this season? Nobody? No. Okay. All right, no worries, that's not a problem. The purpose of this is so that we can get ready to start doing some practice debates by looking and seeing what we know. So knowing what we have already seen from camp evidence, because I'm not sure if everybody went to the WCCDI, um, but I would like us to prepare for next week doing maybe a, a, a practice debates of sorts. And us, before we start using evidence, using what we have gotten down from these lists. So these are our, our we'll call them our claims and we'll make warrants for the debate. But I want everybody to keep this final document because I'll send out a, a list of pairings for us to do some, a, a couple of, depending on who shows up, because it seems as if we kind of get a, a couple of different people every week. So far, it seems like two students, you two, that Hong and Maxim will be here, hopefully. And hopefully we have Harry and Zia join us as well. But I want to make sure that everybody gets this so that we can do a little bit of practice to see how well you're able to create new arguments um, and see, you know, what, what your skills are before we start introducing evidence. Because I know that sometimes it can be a little daunting when you feel like you need to get through an entire 1AC that has all these big cards. Maybe you haven't highlighted properly. Maybe you just don't know exactly how to make your speech exactly right. But I want to be able to see what you, know, what you can do with the information that we know now. Because we have a lot of stuff that everybody in the class has contributed that's based on your own personal knowledge. I heard bits and pieces of what Jasmine was talking about um, in the first part of this conversation in regards to things like the quality of evidence. But know that when you come into the debate round, you don't just come with nothing. You are a person who is related and maybe not an expert insofar as you will be telling everybody about the hill whole history of criminal justice, but you're a person who is involved with the criminal justice system by virtue of being in this country because we're all either on the inside of being related to the criminal justice system or the outside, but regardless, you could always somehow be on the inside or the outside relative to where you are at, at that moment, which basically just means that the law can come into contact with any of us. It can mean that you have a family member that comes into contact with the criminal justice system by being arrested or you have a Tip, well, we're online now, but if you mean and typically when you're in school, if you have a school resource officer that's involved with the criminal justice system, there are so many different th reasons why what you contribute to the debate round gives you some credibility and so what you get to say about the conversation for this topic. And so the all these things that we came up with as a class are examples of claims. And so the reason why I want, wanted you all to attach articles to each of your sentences is that because you can make these claims on your own, you just need to have warrants behind them. But I want us to practice using these things as warrant, these warrants to make our, I'm sorry, using these sentences as claims to develop our own warrant without the articles. Does that make sense? So I'll, I'll make an example. So if we're looking at this first sentence right here that police training is way too short and it makes them insufficiently prepared to protect and serve. In this debate coming up, I won't have any additional evidence, but I'll have to make a, some claims to support this argument. So police training is way too short. So I'd have to figure out exactly, I have to determine an amount of time um, based off of what I can find on the internet about police training, about why it is too short. What's the typical amount of time for police training? Because I think this was Nouriel that contributed this one last week. She was comparing it to other countries around the world that have substantially longer police trainings. And so that would be a part of her warrants. Um, and then another warrant that you would need for this sentence is that they are insufficiently prepared to protect and serve. You would need to be able to prove that the, uh, the length of time for the police training is what makes them insufficient to prepare uh, are insufficiently prepared to protect and to serve. And a way that you could do that is still using that example that Nuriel had contributed last week, which is that other countries in the, in the world have a longer police training 
and lower uh, amounts of crime. And so that would mean that it, will, it might be a correlative reason why extended police training would make them more prepared to adequately protect and serve those communities. I'll send out more directions um, either this evening or sometime tomorrow so that everybody can feel equipped. But the purpose of this, again, is to just make sure that you feel comfortable with using your own brain to make um, the next step of an argument, which is the claim, then the warrant. The 60s, 70s, oh my goodness. Uh, criminologists thought that the prison, like the prison system, the idea of prisons would have been long gone by like the 80s. They're just like, they don't reduce crime. They don't get rid of it. Like they don't do, there's no correlation or strong one between prisons and the reduction of crime. Um, and so they're kind of useless. Um, and so I want y'all to kind of think critically about this, right? Is that why would experts in their field when talking about the both sociological, right? So kind of the implications for how we think about society and how it should operate and informs kind of the behavior of individuals to think how they should operate within a society, right? Um, and also uh, kind of political science is so like criminology is like a mixture of like behavioral studies and like political science studies and a specific criticism of prison industrial complex, how the law works on a punitive level. Just if you didn't know, these are folks who are very tuned in to CJR. That's what their entire shtiz is. So they were like, there's no reason, purpose for prisons if the goal of prisons is to reduce crime. So why would the prisons continue? Because the, quite the opposite of their prediction took place. The opposite. Last time I checked, there is not no prisons anymore. There are not only some prisons, there are a lot of prisons and prisons with different names. We've got private prisons, we've got public and like state, le state and federal level prisons. Um, what happened? What happened? But more so, are we surprised at the maybe residing underlying logic that justifies this? What do you think the logic was, right? Or, and this all is just kind of thinking through speculative, if there's not a correlation between prisons and crime, what do you think the real justification that is that could explain the phenomena, phenomena that we see as a sporadic increase in crime. Politics. Presents. Specifically Nixon, but also other people, but. What, but like, explain, what was the logic of that? So with Nixon, um, one of his big talking points was like, you know, fighting crime and how even though, you know, scientists were saying that prisons are stupid, and you know, like they don't work and talking about like root causes and whatnot, he found that to get to voters more easily, he would just, you know, punish them. And so that was his big thing. And so then he was all for prisons and for fighting against drugs or whatever. So it was just political gain. Yes. So I'm, I'm sensing that there was a cultural argument being made, right? I think that there was an economic argument being made potentially, right? About it might actually make some money, <laughs> you know, for the United States or like just the government proper or just different interest groups within that top level of politics. If we're thinking of super PACs and why, who politicians pander to, right? So this is exactly what you're talking about, Maxim, in terms of Nixon and trying to get the vote is who is he speaking to and whose interests um, are in line with maintaining prisons. There was a heavy economic argument, um, which I think we can find maybe some traces today about why we don't see like as much of maybe a reform, um, just like outside of debate, like, like Ash are saying, what we actually see in the context of reform in CJR. Um, but then the cultural argument too, to like the electorate. So like, what are we saying to citizens who are like, 
I don't have a million dollars. All I have is one ballot where I vote because I believe that the representative who, uh, the representatives who I elect into office will make meaningful change, right, to, to us. Who are those people and what were the arguments being made to them? Of course, the economic one, they're, uh, well, not as much, but for the more pandering type electorate, we're like, yes, like, we need that free labor from inmates. Yeah, that's going to be what we sit and sit at home and comfortably say why we vote one side or not. All right, there are those people. Um, but a larger argument, and you just said it, right, was people were buying into this idea of folks who are more prone or likely to conduct crime and that folks want it to feel protected. They wanted to feel protected because there was a, a narrative being exacerbated that crime is on the rise. You're not safe. Your suburbia is on is in is open to these endless amounts of threats. And if you do not vote in a particular way, we cannot promise you that security. Uh, this sounds strangely familiar to a tweet, if I can recall, from our president. Now I'm not saying. Yeah, I'm not telling you how to feel about politics. That's not what I'm doing. I'm just pointing out correlations and similarities uh, between these things and want y'all to be more critically reflexive to see what these correlations are. President Trump is not the first person to make a cultural argument about crime or a cultural argument about security and protection um, for suburban America uh, as a justification to get folks on board with more hard on crime uh, rhetoric. So yes, all of these things become the weird outlier case that lead to the increase in the amount um, of not only prisons, but the amount of folks who are incarcerated. I don't know if y'all watched my lecture, but the ones who did, you did. But the ones who didn't, I don't know if you know this, but that we have the biggest <laughs> prison population in the world. Our prison population is bigger than certain uh, population numbers of countries. That's where we just kind of get lost in this interesting punitive sauce. Because like, what happened? Are there just that many violent people? Are there that many people who are breaking the law or the law to the extent of being locked away, right? What, what, what is happening? What, like, how did we get to that large number? And I urge y'all to understand that when I say like 2 million, that's not just folks, that, that's just folks who are in prisons, in jails, but there's also like uh, permutations or different areas of uh, the, the legal or the criminal legal system where we're not counting it as a prison or jail, but it's still interacting with like the punitive aspects of the law, like house arrest, uh, for example, or uh, for example, different um, child protective services, juvenile detention centers, uh, just folks who have to pay certain legal fines and fees to be in particular programs that are policing in nature because the moment that a person doesn't show up, regardless of if it's for work requirement or regardless of it being just out of the way for them because they still have to live and exist in a world with additional requirements of coming to court, that that is also part of our criminal justice, criminal legal system. And the reason why I go back and forth between criminal justice and criminal legal is because there is this um, very real criticism um, that folks who work actually in the CJR system will say is that there is no justice in the criminal legal field. There is just the idea or attempt to get to it. Um, and that the kind of real burnout of working in it shows you the realities of the court system, shows you the realities of just kind of how folks are viewed and treated. That's not to say that there is like a no hope safe um, to the system, um, because I'm not going to posit really like opinion based things, but if you can glean what my opinion is from how I talk about things, fine. Um, but I didn't confirm anything. Um, but 
the idea is that when we start from the notion that CJR, criminal justice, uh, it assumes that that is embedded in the system. And so like anything that is done in the system is seen as being just. Like, do you see how that kind of becomes like a confirmation bias that you kind of project it as already being justice regardless of the actual outcome? And so it kind of creates this self-fulfilling prophecy that does not actually speak to the reality. That can be successes and failures within the system. The issue is positing it as, you know, a justice framing first. So that's something that I would like to kind of throw into y'all's vernacular and I like just want when we're thinking about CJR um, because folks in the actual field are like, we don't refer to it as that. Um, so yeah, uh, last thing that I'm gonna talk about and it's gonna be quick, is just um, sentencing, policing, forensic science. The things that I'm gonna say, uh, or yeah, the things that I'm gonna say and honestly for uh, Maxim and Hong who did read, I'm interested to see how these questions unfold in the activity that Brooke had in terms of like, as you created more kind of reforms, what you were thinking with the lecture that we can reflect on and talk about as we go through that. Um, so like, that's what I'll be kind of sitting here for. And also Brooke, because she knows how the system works and what these things are anyway, too, uh, will be. Uh, so sentencing, oh my gosh. Um, honestly, it's a mess. If you have heard of things such as mandatory minimum sentencing laws um, and uh, bay, what is it, plea bargains, and the kind of way in which the court system operates, it first begs the question of the federal and state level distinctions for crimes. Um, there is a large amount of kind of ambiguity that exists between what is in the jurisdiction of the federal government versus what is in the jurisdiction of the state governments. And the largest reason is because, because of the 10th Amendment. Are we familiar with uh, the 10th Amendment of the Constitution? If not, that's okay, because honestly, I had to return back to it when I put the lecture because I was like, what are the exact words in that uh, amendment? And what does that, all that mean? Uh, the parts that I'm focusing on is that it's a question of states' rights, right? Like, what protects the states from federal kind of oversight? Um, what do states have that gives them autonomy in relationship to the federal government not being usurped? Because you know, this is happening during the time of like the Bill of Rights, the Bill of Rights being written, and kind of a transition from the AOC Articles of, of Confederation, and also just like the Revolution. So there was a big like focus on making sure that there was a, oh, I was like, what was that? I was like, no, don't say, <laughs> the fog came back and it got dark and got light again, sorry. Um, but like there was this big fear of tyranny, right? There was a big fear of power not being balanced. And so the federal and state level of government are trying to figure out what this balance is. So in terms of CJR, the federal government kind of defaults to a lot of state interpretation of statutes. Uh, the, fe the federal government will kind of create the baseline of what a statute is. Uh, the interpretation of that statute in terms of how to engage with how to mediate sentencing protocols or how to mediate the um, kind of ways in which prison, uh, prison police funds um, are allocated and moved around become decisions made by the states because they are, quote, best able to know the particular needs of the citizens in their region. The federal government is preoccupied with all the states, right? It's preoccupied with also being the federal government and figuring out how to get the funds and resources to keep the system going and also to help reconcile discrepancies when there seems to be misinterpretation or also just like confusion uh, between states, right? So this is what we call like uh, inter-state uh, conflict or interstate mis misinterpretation. That's when the federal government fills in. So a majority of this stuff is done on the state level. Um, so if that was like something like, no, it's not, it is. Um, there are crimes that are only dealt with on the federal level, but these things, the way in which those are interpreted is one, if it's about like a federal prison, two, if it's about like a conflict between states, 
that not two kind of interpretations or statutes of the states can deal with. And so the way in which sentencing, mandatory minimum sentencing, plea bargains, and all of that stuff operates is through those state interpretations. Uh, are they biased? Yes. Uh, are there kind of fixed interpretations for a crime meeting the consequence? No. Um, and uh, are they kind of racially charged? Hmm. I mean, you insert that. I won't. Uh, but, you know, catch my vibe. The next will be forensic science. Forensic science. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. I heard y'all's conversations about it last week. It is... So one plus one equals two, right? Right? One plus one equals two? And two plus two equals four? And like five plus five equals ten. Right? So what the frick is forensic science? Like, what does that mean in the context of science and rationality and being able to say a crime has been committed? If you understand how messed up the forensic science arena is in the CJR system, you understand why I just had to do some simple math things, things that make sense and that there are correlations for. And then there are things that require imagination, right? That require Disney magic, that require narrative, because it's a lot of spin, it's a lot of bias, and it's a lot of vague, it could have been anybody. Honestly, That's DNA true. is not easily traceable, but also from real scientists, not, okay, I don't wanna say real scientists, because forensic scientists are yeah. real scientists. The issue is solely relying on that in the context of like saying a crime was committed by a particular person. But scientists who kind of are also like chemi like let's say chemists, for example, right? Um, or even if we think about COVID testing, it takes so long to get results, right? From just directly getting a swab from somebody's body, right? Like you know that you swabbed one person and it still takes a long time to retrieve accurate information about the like a bill like the the likelihood of you having the disease but also the tracing of it it's not like all parts of the dna were being traced for covid so then if we were to just kind of pull that back and go all right so there is dna on the ground uh we taped up the scene when the situation was found and then we found these little samples of DNA that are centered around the scene. I, let's just say I was minding my business at the grocery store, living my best Trader Joe's lifestyle, right? As I usually do. Um, and I just didn't know that two hours after I walk across the parking lot and I'm like, oh my gosh, I fell and like scrape my knee. I trip, I fall. It is something that I do. Um, or like not even scrape my knee, or I was, I scraped my knee, my mom behind me, because I don't got a car, I don't drive, so my mom is generally with me too, she walks behind me, two hours later, crime scene is taped off, I'm now also a suspect, I'm now also somebody who could be brought down to the crime if we were to focus solely on forensic science, right, being a um, identi identificating factor for who did the crime. I mean, you're thinking, but people know that, and they won't use that in court. Um, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, this is not a drill. This is real life. Um, they do. And there's been a lot of court cases where you're like, but the court clearly with Supreme Court justices did not default to, you know, the prosecution. No way. Um, wish I could tell you that. Uh, I think there was a, quote, a case that I talked about in the lecture. It was something versus Williams, or I talked about it in the lecture, didn't write it down in the PowerPoint, but the scenario was simple. It was this young man who has been accused of um, sexual assault uh, towards um, a woman and he was like I was never around I, I don't know who this person is I did not do this like etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and there what there is an argument about how experts in the field can be used to make evidence seem more expert 
right? So it happened to be, and this is how this works, an expert, or like a forensic scientist or just a doctor, not even does, does lab stuff in particular, I was like, let me just go take his DNA and do some like tracing really quickly. I, she gave it to the lab, didn't tell the lab why. And that is what allows for a federal interpret or, or the legal interpretation of this being just. She did not tell the lab why she was doing the DNA sample. Lab was not doing this to find one person, even though she had the profile, gave the DNA to the lab to cross compare and it matched, right? But if you remember what I just said about me walking down, you know, the sidewalk um, and also being kind of, all right, now you're a suspect. I'm like, honestly, that wasn't my, that wasn't my fight. I don't know what the, I don't know what happened there. I was just at Trader Joe's living my best life. They had a deal on strawberries. I got excited and I didn't do this. That wasn't the red I was claiming, you know, <laughs> no, but now I'm, I'm on the, like, I'm on the stand pleading for my innocence. That's cool. Um, and so they were able to, the argument was that you should not be able to use that evidence because of just a doctor who has no association to the actual kind of lab work that was done, but because she is a doctor, she is seen as being an expert, um, and therefore she's able to use her like statements um, in front of a jury. Juries are so biased, and when you hear a doctor say doctor things, unless like you've got like a critical cognitive moment of being like something doesn't add up here, you're like, you know what, the doctor said it, so okay, sure. Um, and so she was able to make these statements and say there was DNA comparison. Here's the really additional messed up part of this. The actual lab sampling and the invent, like all the kind of actual results and all the data and math that were done, didn't even have to get shown to the jury when she initially made that statement. So they were basing it off of just a statement, right? And so that was also something that you would think that's not right. That's not something you can't retract once a doctor has said something, right? Or once like a witness or a testimonial has said something, like you can remove it from like the record or you can't base your decision off of that, but you can't remove it having been said, right? And so that's going to be in the minds of the jury, a jury who we're, al we're allowing to be kind of swayed by not false science, but science that is not able to reconcile nor deal um, with, I believe, making quick, clear-cut decisions about uh, crime. Last thing is policing. The only thing I want to say about policing is it's a mess. Um, and that in the past 13 years, I said, um, of 13, 20, something, a ridiculous amount of years, it's more than a decade, um, of all the police brutality cases that have occurred. So like, this is like data that's been tracked of police officers who have killed um, a civilian. Only five have been convicted, right? Five of hundreds, thousands, and that should tell you enough of what's going on. One of the biggest things though for why that is true is that police officers have what's called immunity. Um, and that's because they're seen as being, like that's their job. They kind of, they are given a lot of what soldiers uh, in the military are given uh, in terms of, we don't think of that as murder. That's them doing their job. And if killing someone is a thing, that's like it's the thing that comes with them doing their job. That's kind of what how police officers' immunity is kind of like is seen as is that yes, their job does come with the understanding that they might have to take a life, and because of that statement, it allows for a harder threshold or a higher threshold to prove uh, why that officer deserves to be convicted of a crime because instead that was the necess that was the kind of unfortunate reality of the job. So they're not really treated like civilians um, in that sense. They become like state agents slash um, officers of the law. And so that's something that the state uh, justifies or at least says there's a harder threshold, um, higher threshold for you to prove that that was mal malign um, and murder. 
because it has to be seen as being like malign murder in order to be like a conviction of um, guilt. So yeah, that's where we're at. And so that's where I'm going to end it. Kind of went a little over. <laughs>